All right. Over the last 10 years, information visualization or data visualization or InfoVis is sometimes abbreviated. I think I have to hold this. It's just not going to work. You'll hear me? Okay. Right. Emerged is one of the most vibrant and dynamic areas of contemporary culture. So if you go to one of the more popular websites, or actually blogs by Minion Lima, who is about to publish a whole book about network visualization, you will see that uh, when he selects most visually interesting visualizations of complex networks, he has as many projects for art as for biology, food webs and knowledge networks, music and others. Now, this is a very interesting moment where people in humanities are just beginning to discover the use of visualization as a new tool for cultural research and understanding history. In fact, the very first conference about visualization in humanities just took place at MIT uh, a couple of weeks ago. So in my talk, I'm going to discuss uh, a set of techniques and methods we've been kind of developing uh, in uh, the lab, which I set up at UCSD uh, three years ago, called Software Studies. Uh, and also, we'll try to ask larger questions about both possibilities of visualization as a new tool, or perhaps even new medium for theoretical reflection, right? its limitations and its advantages. Now, guys, I'm sorry I have to sit here. I mean, I can't just uh, roam around and switch PowerPoint because the whole idea of our approach is to make very big images so we can see details. So that's why, you know, I can't even use PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, you can follow our work at softwarestudies.com. Uh, you can uh, find all our visualizations, which we probably add almost daily on Flickr. And you can always email me at manwitch.csd. Uh, a kind of tentative name for our approach, uh, which of course we don't own, and it's also done by others, is cultural analytics. Uh, so the idea is you take some data sets, which you know, are ideally as big as possible. I mean, for example, all 48 billion photographs on Facebook. You know, but you can also start with 10 photographs. You may or may not apply automatic image analysis. We'll talk about this in detail. Even you use visualization, and also try to create new interfaces for media explorations, which allow us to see patterns across cultural artifacts and processes. In here, I'm going to quote Ben Schneiderman, one of the pioneers of contemporary information visualization and professor at the University of Maryland, who said, images were a thousand words, interfaces were thousand, thousands of images. Uh, I also want to acknowledge other people who work with me at UCSD and also uh, at, uh, multi at Multimodal Analysis Lab at the University, sorry, at the University of, National University of Singapore. So, how can we uh, explore patterns in visual media? How can we visualize visual media without reducing it as visualization normally does? to vector primitives, such as, vector, such as lines, curves, and points. Right? In fact, you know, if you go and look at typical visualization today, I mean, you'll see that even though these representations are quite complex, you know, we do throw away lots of information in order to show you patterns and visualizations normally made from kind of simple uh, graphic primitives. So can we do things differently? Uh, so I'm going to propose two general methods for visualization, or perhaps we can use a different concept, exploratory analysis. So the idea is if you have a big data set, you just kind of want to explore it, get a feeling for it, and then uh, to figure out you know, what patterns may be or what maybe you have to get more data. And the first method which I'm going to propose, I'm going to call this direct visualization. So normally visualization involves representation of patterns using vector primitives, and it also involves quantification, right? Because when I'm making bar chart or an XY graph, I have to have some numbers which will control the height of each bar or positions of points in the graph. 
So is it possible to make visualization without primitives and without, without uh, quantification? Uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to take pictures and we're going to translate them into new pictures in order to reveal patterns in the original pictures. So let me show you some examples. Um, so this is all the covers of Time magazine, uh, which started to be published in uh, 1922. So it's a uh, 4,000, let me see, I can always remember. So it's, a, it's close to 5,000 covers, right, from 20, 27, from, sorry, from, 20, from 22 until 2009. And what we simply did is we downloaded all the covers from Google Books. Uh, we made sure we're all the same size in order to help the eye notice the patterns. And we simply arranged them, right, by publication date. So each, so because magazine is published every week, so it'll be like week one, week two, etc. So the 22, 1922 is here, right? It goes left to right, top to bottom. And then uh, 2009 is here. So let's zoom out and see what we can find. Oh, sorry, zoom, yes. Okay. So right away, you basically see more than enough to write a couple of research articles. Okay, first of all, uh, and I'm sure you can find more, but here are some things which I, you know, I saw here. So first of all, I, I expected that black and white would become color at some point, but it turns out it's a very gradual development, right? So colors first introduces one color, two colors, and then for a while, like the, color, right, the black and white covers and the color covers uh, alternate. Interesting. So one thing which visualization allows you to do, it allows you to describe and make possible conversation about what, right, what uh, Bardell called long durée, the gradual changes over decades or even centuries. Now, another thing is, uh, which is interesting, it's not surprising that over time, the saturation and the contrast of covers is increasing. So we can say that visual culture becomes more and more aggressive. Right? But what is surprising is that in the last 10 years, this trend seems to be reversed, right? So if you notice, from the last 10 years, suddenly it becomes more monochrome, more silver, so something is going on. But you also notice this very kind of interesting, mysterious color bands. So just as Picasso, right, has a, a pink period and then the blue period, the time seem to, the time cover seem to be dominated, right, by different hues, and they seem to change every seven, eight years, and maybe probably not so visible because of um, uh, light in the room and projector, but uh, you can go to Flickr and look at this image. Now, you also may notice various changes in content, but since I have a few more visualizations of time, I will discuss them later. So that's you know, the most simple thing you can do. Simply take images, which form kind of time series, and present them uh, in a grid. Now, the next technique is going to be we're going to, you know, basically I'm starting with all, most, you know, most simple and towards more complex. In order, to reveal, in order to reveal other patterns, it may be useful not to display all the information, right, but to actually sample the data. Right? So we're now going to make visualization, which is still going to consist from original media, right? uh, but instead of taking every single cover, every single pixel, we're going to do some of it. Okay, uh, and this is technique which we borrowed from medical imaging. So it's used in medical imaging and biological research every day. So I'm going to call it a slice because this is how the medical imaging software which I'm using calls it. Okay, so here's our slice. Okay, so what we have is, so you basically have about 70 years compressed into this image. And in this case, every cover is represented as one vertical line. Uh, for those of you who are kind of media digital artists and want to know how it's done, it's very simple. You take cover number one, you select pixels in the line which goes through the center of the cover, and you copy it into a new image and you keep going. So, every, so, so you can think about uh, phenomena such as Time Magazine as a kind of body, a historical body, and just as photographing something from different point of view, or taking x-rays or doing MRI, Right? 
front, side, etc. is going to reveal different structures of this body. What we're doing is hypothet what we're doing is metaphorically speaking, we're kind of photographing, right? The historical body of Time magazine and different points of view are going to reveal different structures. So I think this part visual this visualization technique is particularly useful in understanding the changes in layout. So we can see how the logo time occupies a certain space and then it becomes smaller. And it seems like in the 20s, it's like in the 30s, it seems like going up and down erotically. I mean, so, so, so kind of neurotically, it seems like we can't figure out exactly where to put it. And then uh, it settles down, becomes red. And it's interesting, it, keep, you know, it still keeps jumping up and down, which is surprising, I guess, depending on what the cover represents. Now, you also find uh, that, of course, the most important visual shift in this history happens here when we decide to go from an image which only occupies part of a page to the image which occupies the whole page. Now, this kind of visualization reveals not only changes in layout and graphic design, but also changes in the content. I assume that you can see this kind of organ, this historical organ here, right, which is all yellow. So what is this organ? Well, what this organ is, it's actually, uh, uh, you know, maybe 15 or 20 years, right, which is uh, kind of happens here, but it's not as visible here. Where the, when the war starts, uh, they switch from photography back to painting, and all the covers represent kind of faces, right? So here they are, right? And, but here, you know, uh, because you kind of, you kind of think too much information, this pattern is not so visible. But when we switch to this representation, you can see how during this period, the covers are very, very similar because they, they all represent people, of course, primarily men. Uh, actually, um, they counted and the percentage of, of women in the covers doesn't change from 1922 until now. It's 9%. And percentage of people of color also doesn't change slightly, but it's about 11, 12 percent. Uh, so it's true; it is 89 percent white men. Uh, and and you know, and this is this kind of organ, right, of whiteness. <laughs> okay, let's continue. Uh, now let's see if we can apply this technique to our data. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm, we are going to look at the film. And it so happens that this is one of the films by Ziga Vertov. And uh, when uh, uh, last year, uh, Austrian Film Museum approached our lab and said, can you guys work on visualizing the data, uh, metadata and the films of Ziga Vertov? Of course, I was secretly happy because I'm so much invested in the Vertov. But then I thought, oh my god, people will say, Lev will never leave Vertov. I mean, you know, what about, I mean, what about, you know, Melier and the, uh, Godard and all the other people, right? Nevertheless, so Earth was going to be our new body, we're going to photograph, so to speak. And the reason I use metaphor of photography is on purpose. We can say photography and film and other techniques of lens-based imaging were, let's say, primary representational apparatus of industrial society. And right? so what you're photographing or uh, filming, videotaping is visible reality. And you try to, uh, right, uh, add some meanings to montage or composition, as I've seen, and so on. We can say that visualization is a new photography of, of, of data society. What you're photographing is data, right? So that's why, for, that's why I keep using the metaphor of photography. Okay, so let's see what we can do with Virtov. Uh, uh, so what I've done is I basically took the film uh, using software which has been around since 1990, it's of course all, I mean, most of the problems we use are open source. Uh, you automatically uh, segment a film into shots. It's about, depending on the film, it's between 95 and 98 percent accurate. And then I took the first frame of every shot. And I also took last frame of every shot because I was curious to think, to ask how much difference between first frame and last frame, right? So, so how much, how much visual changes in every shot? Okay, so let's take a look. Okay. So once again, right, you have two rows. Wow, I hate that it happens, guys. Um, I don't know how to go back, okay? Anybody knows Photoshop well enough to tell me how to? What? 
No, it's not orbit. Okay, anybody wants to come and help me because I always forget how to do it. Where's that? Anybody wants to do it? Yeah, but you know, if I go, if I could never, it's going to line up. Okay? Yeah, but see what happens is like, it's like some kind of permanent, permanent vertical. Okay, you do it. You architect. You do it. I don't know. I think it might be. No, like basically, if you go a bit more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I'm just going to load this. Yeah. Okay, sure. I'm, I'm just going to I'm just going to load this again. Yeah. Okay. Look, I'm just going to load this again. Sorry, guys. Just don't worry. Uh, I'm just going to load this again uh, to see. I hope this remembers. Well, I didn't apply anything, but I can't get it there. Right? I mean, I didn't do anything. Uh, it just happens all the time, and uh, there is a way to. Sorry, guys. Okay. I promise I'll take advanced Photoshop, Photoshop and Illustrator course before next year. Okay, so here we go. Sorry, guys. Okay, we'll not touch it. Okay. okay, so what you have is. Okay, let's keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. What you have is. Okay, can I just touch it once? <laughs> Okay. So basically, uh, you have one shot, right, which goes which goes like this. And I want to touch it, right? So here's one shot. First frame, last frame. Wow, this is here. And this is the second shot. And you know, Vertov, you know, basically the reason Vertov, right? I mean, his uh, real name was Kaufman, so Vertov was his artistic name. And Vertov in Russian means to rotate, which of course refers both to the cyclical movement of a camera, but also to this activity of movement, right? Think about the importance of uh, movement as a kind of iconography of industrial era, right? Uh, the moving factory machines, the moving trains, and so on. Well, if you actually analyze the film this way, you find that it's almost the opposite. I'm going to scroll and you tell me, guys, what, if it's, what you're seeing here. Absolutely. So what happens is that his compositions are, so there is actually a change in the frame. You have like workers building communism, right, by, I don't know, breaking something apart, right, or people looking to the sky. But, you know, the images, they almost like, they almost like a static, static, you know, they almost like static still images. So it completely changes your idea about this film. Well, it's because it doesn't care. Yes, I know that. I know that. Okay, but but did you know that about this film before? I didn't. Okay. Yeah. He does, okay. He doesn't know. Why does he know? Why doesn't he pay? I mean, I have my hypothesis, right? Further the revolution. Huh? Panning does not further the revolution. It's making iconic images. Yes, absolutely. Okay. But but look. He, does, he doesn't do anything else, right? Isn't this kind of surprising? Well, I'm, if I'm not surprised, I'm really sorry for you. Would you I'm say that's a stylistic choice, or is it more than something that's creating powerful emotive connection with the audience at that time? Because it's front and center shots, and that's the way it was Well, guys, I mean, we can have a, we can have a long discussion about it. I mean, I think I think you're right. I think we can also say that you know the resolution, right, the kind of image resolution, at this point is really low, and um, if you start painting, it's possible that the images will become harder to read. But I think it also has to do with the whole Russian idea of montage, that you want to completely control meaning of the image, and you want to create meaning through the juxtaposition of shots. And the best way to do it is to basically just make stills. Because the movement kind of introduces, you know, some some you know some some degree of freedom, which is harder to control, right? People would get confused. Yeah, absolutely. Confusion is not good for evolution. Absolutely. Okay. So now we're going to try a new technique, where before we're going to visualize our data, we're going to use uh, we're going to measure it using software. Again, these techniques have been around since the late 50s. Like every time you take a picture with a digital camera, it actually measures brightness, contrast, uh, colors of the scene, and automatically adjusts 
setting the software so you get the best picture. These techniques are also built in Photoshop every time you blur or sharpen or add noise to image using these techniques. So we're going to use uh, these techniques to measure various visual characteristics of the image or video and then uh, use our measurements to position the images in the visualization. Okay. Let me uh, immediately go to examples. Okay. So we're going to take... Oh, I see what happened here. Um, yeah, this is one image which doesn't want to open. You know what? Uh, let's go to the next one. Okay, just to realize what it's so it is. Yeah, okay, let's... Uh, well, I, do, I didn't want to open this. Let's see why. There's something about this image which doesn't want to go. Okay, let me give me just one second. I apologize. Okay, sorry. Sorry guys, give me one second. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so what you basically have is a different different way to look at the history of Time magazine. So the images are arranged chronologically. And then what you're doing is you measure a particular visual property of these covers, which can be anything, texture, composition, presence of faces, right? So of course for computer it's much easier to measure what's called low level, low level features. And it's doing exactly what your, what your eye is doing, right? So you, you eye, the eye, right, the light falls on the retina, you have rows and cones, and then this information travels up to visual cortex, right? And according to contemporary neuroscience, UI is doing something similar, right? It's extracting this kind of basic features from images, and then the brain somehow puts it together, we don't know how, we don't know why. So in this case, we did the simple possible thing. So the height of every image is simply the saturation, right? The saturation of this image, and you get something like this, and it kind of gives you a different way to look at the time. Right? And uh, should we go? I think I went too far. What? what? Saturation. Saturation of color. What, what metric? What, what metric? Like, what? Well, you mentioned, well, okay, it's a mean of saturation, right? Mean of saturation of all colors in the image, average saturation. Okay. Okay, yes, sorry. Okay, so here you go. Okay. And uh, you can say, well, yeah, what's, you know, they already saw so many things. I mean, what's this good for? Well, I think what this is really good for is to see the, uh, how spread your data is in time, right? So you notice that in the beginning, all the covers are very similar in terms of saturation, and then over time, right, it becomes more and more diverse. So within the same you know, month, it goes up and down. And then once again, you're seeing these mysterious cyclical patterns. So you kind of wonder if 19th century historians of culture were right, if culture does have cycles. But I will take this idea in your brains and we'll leave it there. Right. Okay, now let's look at some of the stuff. So now let's uh, use uh, this ability of a computer to automatically measure images and turn visual properties into numbers to analyze video games. Okay. Okay. okay, so first we'll do some direct visualizations just to familiarize ourselves with the subject matter. Uh, so this is 62 and a half hours of gameplay at Kingdom Hearts 2, a popular Japanese game. So our student played the whole game, recorded this in video, and then we tried to make this uh, grid. Uh, and we tried to, you know, we tried to put as much information as was possible to fit in computer memory. So basically we're not able to save image with the software load larger than two and a half gigabytes. <laughs> Uh, or 44,000 by 44,000 pixels. And what we've done is we basically sampled the video, I think this is like one frame every few seconds. Okay, so I'll show you what you get. And basically, you know, I'm just showing you the game, right? Because if I start showing 62 hours videos, then my lecture will never finish, right? 
So, of course, you know, if you want to start analyzing, for example, all videos on YouTube, or if you want to compare you know, 10,000 films of 20th century history, it's very convenient to reduce a film to a static image because you can just you know, put lots of these images next to each other and uh, see the patterns, right? Okay, so here it is, here's the game. You see this different color, again, color periods, which in this case corresponds to different Disney properties, which this game engages with, different worlds. Now, we can also do something we already did before. We can do a slice. Okay, so again, we're going to turn every frame into a single line. Okay, keep going, keep going, keep going. And we can say that just as astronomic images, just as medical imaging, it may be not apparent right away what you're seeing, but if you work with images for a while, you're going to learn how to read them. Oh my god, it's really like an hour and a half. Um, so, for example, you know, this was a probably this was a probably part where the you know, where the character was kind of quickly moving in time, and this was a part where something was very static. Ava, Ava the character was just kind of sitting there and contemplating, or uh, maybe you have our periods where you are basically just looking at the screen and the screen does not change. So you can realize you can see kind of a temporal pattern of playing a game. It's not all this kind of frenetic movement, right? the way it's often part of the media, it takes alternations, right, between kind of still periods and the dynamic periods. Okay? So can, to continue, we said, can we actually automatically take this kind of video and break it to get a better sense of a timeline of different type of activities the player, the player is doing? And uh, this is how it looks. Okay, so this is all done automatically by computer. Uh, so what you have is, here's a little legend. Okay. Okay. So we identified, again, this is you know, the first thing we've done. So just at the beginning, we identified different types of movement, different types of activity in the game. Loading menu, starting, loading menu, 3D motion, uh, watching, watching for motion video. And uh, with different you know, timeline, different colors correspond. And, you know, this is just was a demonstration for about 20 minutes. But you can see how you can use this to analyze the kind of pattern or the kind of temporal activity, right? The pattern of uh, temporal interaction with the work of art, such as a video game. So when we said, okay, can we actually extend it? So this is the next thing we've done. Uh, this was done in combination of undergraduates and graduate students at UCSD. The whole thing was about two weeks of work. So what we've done is, you know, we took, uh, again, this is a demonstration, this is not statistically significant. We took uh, one video game for every year from 88 until, uh, actually, is there a way to turn the slides down? You guys, you know, right, so you're kind of suffering there. So we took one game for every year, whatever games the students wanted, so don't ask me. Uh, we took about 10 minutes and then we measured these properties and then we automatically turn each game into kind of two timelines. Well, that's wonderful, into two timelines okay. where um, the dark gray corresponds to this kind of quiet times, maybe you're watching full motion video or maybe you're loading a menu or you're just thinking. And the gray, right, the light gray is a, is a kinetic time, right? What Army calls kinetic time, right? You're kind of moving around, doing things in the landscape, right? collecting, right? health tokens, you know, etc. And what's interesting is that for every single game, right, it's a different proportion, and we can basically start beginning to see that in terms of our temporal experiences, the games right, fall in a very wide space of possibilities. In this case, these two types of activities, kinetic and, and uh, non-kinetic, right, basically interact back and forth, this is all the time. In this case, we have these moments of uh, uh, interactive, what we, what we call interactive time, punctuated by quiet moments, we'll be looking at the menu. And also, the proportions are very, very different. So, if we extend the study and do it for you know, longer periods, and more games, and more players, perhaps your idea about the games Right? That we all kind of, that, that many of the games, especially first person shooters, are very similar. And all you're doing is just constantly pressing things. It changes, right? Because the games turn out to have 
variety of different patterns of temporal activity. So how much time, when do you guys actually finish? Uh, uh, what do you think? So they started like around, it's already 11.15. Uh, yeah, guys, I, mean, I can go until midnight, right? So. Okay, great. Okay, well, we want to have some time for discussion, so let me just kind of try to take it. That's good. Uh, okay. okay, let me show you a couple more things. Okay, this is fine, this is fine, okay. This is fine. Well, actually, I actually showed you, okay, let me show you just a couple more things here, just a second. Uh, I think it's going well. Now, so one of the interesting things is you can kind of, uh, because obviously, as somebody who is uh, as also interested in the history of culture and media, I'm particularly interested in the use of visualization to visualize gradual historical processes, right? The simply temporal processes. So you can look at the changes over the course of 10 frames of a film, or you can look at the changes in a particular media over 100 years. So in this case, our scale about 10 minutes. In this, ca in this case, our scale is 62 hours. In the case of Time magazines, our scale was 70 years. So the longest we've done so far is about 140 years. Uh, so let me show you one example. So this is, uh, again, you know, back to the idea of uh, kind of sampling and temporal artifact. So what we've done is, you know, we took simply all the frames right, in uh, this film. So we took all the shots, we selected one frame for every shot, and we simply made this automatic storyboard, which kind of allows you again to talk about patterns, narrative, cinematographic, ideological, visual in this film. And, you know, I'm not claiming that you know, like I think until we do some studies, I mean, it's hard to say if when people start using these tools, we'll be able to notice new things. But, I mean, I can tell you a couple of things which you can see here you know, as examples of something which we know very well, and maybe something which is, would be harder to notice if you simply watch film in a normal way. So, of course, uh, so, of course, what you're seeing are the you know, very characteristic patterns of a kind of montage. Oh, let me try to find something. Okay. For example, here, right? So we have a room looking up, and then we have this worker. Uh, and, oh, for example, especially in the beginning, right? Uh, so here, for example, we have this kind of montage between the close-up of these workers building you know, the communism and their legs. So that's kind of expected, we know that, right? But then you start noticing some other interesting things. Like you notice all the shots of people, right? All the shots of people looking up towards a bright future. Future, you're like, okay, that's interesting. And then you kind of wonder, well, some of them are looking in one direction, some are looking in a different direction. Well, maybe it's a pattern, right? Uh, so I do think that visual, this kind of visualization, it's, I mean, you can think about it as ostranenia or, or estrangement, or the concept of Likoshkovsky. And just as Vertov, Chenka, uh, Mahalinaj, Vesetki applied new unusual points of view in order to make people, right, see reality in new ways, we can now, in a kind of second, right, in the second stage, apply these techniques to their artifacts to help us see familiar artifacts in new ways. Now, uh, we can apply these techniques to high and low. So here is a, a visualization uh, which we've done. We kind of went to Google. We downloaded every single Google logo. So that was last summer, so now we have more from 98. So whatever logos are made available, because you know every day they change logos, so it's not all of them, whatever was available. And uh, we used the like, measurement as a way to try to understand uh, variability, right? Variability in this particular ecology 
of Google logo, right? Because, of course, what's interesting about a logo and a brand, on the one hand, you have to have certain continuity, right? Otherwise, your brand image is going to dissolve. On the other hand, you know, what, what Google has chosen is to give us new logos every day. Uh, so we're kind of wondering, right? I mean, how many logos are actually close to the original? And how many logos are outside, right? So we can go see what's now. I think over time it became more and more wild, right? So let's see what we have today. Okay, so it's really getting wild, right? You can't ever recognize word, word Google. But last time it wasn't so wild. So what you have here is, uh, let me start zooming in. So basically what you're going to see is the center. So, if, so the logos which are close to the center, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So the logos which are, so the, the most important dimension is horizontal. Okay. So the logos which are on the left are very close to the original. And then if you go towards the right, you're going to see the logos which modify the original more and more. And what you find right away without even zooming in, it's a kind of Gaussian distribution, right? Where it's kind of interesting, right? So we have, some, but what's interesting is the Gaussian distribution which is really centered on certain degree of variability, right? And certain degree of modification. So we have just a couple of logos which are original. We have lots of logos which modify the original in some ways. And here we have out outliers. Okay, let's take a look. Okay. Okay. So you notice here, we have, right, things where, you know, we just, we just change this G a little bit. And then as you go down, okay. Okay, oh, it's slowly, 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 right? We get more and more change, more and more. And then, um, you know, until it gets really out there, right? Of course, you can also do it over time. It's, we just kind of put this in the feature space. How did we do it? Very simple, right? We took the original Google logo, right? We made a kind of template. And then we superimposed this template against right, every particular logo and simply measured the, number, the amount of change, right? And then the vertical dimension may be not so interesting, uh, but you know, we have to put something. So vertical dimension seems that the logos which are modified towards the bottom are uh, here, and the logos which are modified towards the top of the logo are actually on top. Let me see if there's anything else here, or I think we go forward. Uh, okay, so I was promised you to, I promised you to look at the longer periods of time. Okay, so here's a particular slice of film history. Uh, this is uh, 1,100 films, 1,100 films, and we took the data from Cinematrix website, run by Yuri Tsegyan from the University of Chicago, with respect to film scholar. And again, you know, I'm not claiming that this is all, all film history. And again, remember, this, remember our metaphor of photography, right? Or x-ray. So when you photograph something or you make an x-ray, you're not, uh, you're not going to get all the information about the object. You're going to get information about the object as seen from a particular point of view. Right? So here, because we can only kind of put, right, it's a two-dimensional graph, uh, so uh, a particular point of view which we chose is to look at the speed of editing across the interstitial cinema. So each point corresponds to a single film, and then the y-coordinate, right, which is what controls the height of each point, corresponds to uh, how fast this film is, which is its average shot length, right? So if a film has an average shot length of 500 seconds, which happens to be milliers, right? Voyage does La Lune. It's very, very slow. Right? Here's Griffith. And then here's, the, okay. And then if, you know, if, if uh, films are here, it means they're very, very fast. So you find interesting things right away. Just as Russian history was so kind of violent and goes back and forth, right, between all the extremes from communism to the most brutal form of capitalism, the Russians really frame this graph. They are most slow and they also most fast. Here's Tika Berkov and here's a Tarkovsky. Now, it's interesting that Griffith, okay, uh, some of his films are exactly in the middle on the timeline. Here's another classical Hollywood filmmaker, John Ford. But what's surprising is somebody who at some time, at some point, was thought of as somebody working outside the system, at least in terms of editing speed, which is Jim Jarmusch, turns out to be also exactly right in the middle. Now, of course, it's not surprising that 
uh, over time, the speed of editing increases. We can perhaps attribute it to, to the uh, influence of MTV. And unfortunately, we don't really have enough data here uh, to make more precise predictions. Okay, now, uh, so far we're showing static visualizations, but actually all the static visualizations in most cases are simply particle outputs from interactive visualization programs we're using to interactively explore media. So next I'm going to show you a couple of interactive visualization tools which we developed, right? And again, think of these images I'm showing you as simply screenshots. Uh, so because of, you know, I can't show you all of it, we developed lots of software last year. So first I'm going to show you a unique application which runs on a custom computer, developed also at UCSD, uh, which happens to be the highest re resolution visualization system in the world. And you can see why, right? Because the moment you start looking at lots and lots of images, you don't really want to do it on a 14-inch screen, right? Uh, so uh, let me show you a video. Okay. Uh, Likely with the internet here. Okay, maybe actually, oh, we have some, right? Wonderful. Okay. So here it is. Oh, okay. Actually, can you guys switch your audio, please? Okay, so what I'll try to do, I'll try to finish that in about 12 minutes, and then we'll have 25 minutes of discussion. start preparing the next demo in a while because maybe I know how long it takes. Okay. Well, if you guys sit very, very quietly, you'll probably hear the audio from my laptop. But you can try that. Okay, well, uh, while, you know, while the, okay, I'm going to start by showing you the version which you can actually use. It's an open source application developed in Singapore on the Flash. Uh, with, uh, the, moment I, the moment I find one day to write documentation, uh, it will become available for download. So if you're interested, just keep watching our website, Software Studies. I hope to make it available for download sometime in July. Uh, so here's the application. We are going to open a particular data set. Whoa. Not now. Not now. Okay. So we're going to open a particular data set, uh, which happens to be part of a large research project we're doing, uh, where we're trying to see how this paradigm would work on the, on the larger data. Not just 50 hours of video game or 1,000 films. Uh, so what we're looking at is what we're looking at is wow. Okay. Is uh, 900 manga titles, and we downloaded 1 million pages. Uh, so this particular application would only allow me to look a few thousand pages at a time. But I'll show you some visualizations I've done 
it took uh, later, it took two days to render where we see all million pages at once. Okay, so let's open. Uh, so we basically can we program automatically, you basically prepare the data as a simple spreadsheet, right? The program automatically converts it into, uh, interesting, into uh, MySQL database. Okay. So here we have a canvas. So my idea was is to develop a program which will allow me to make multiple graphs, explore connections in data, will allow me to make graphs which will contain images, as well as points, and also save it at 300 dpi, so I can basically make artworks right, directly from this program or article or pictures for publication. Okay, so I'm going to add a graph. Uh, let's make it a little bit larger. So how are we doing with sound? Okay. okay. And uh, what I have here is access to all the different dimensions, all the different parameters of the data. So I'm going to start by choosing a couple of parameters, which are going to happen. The simplest one to understand, which is mean, and a standard deviation, no brightness values, we measured every page. Okay. And uh, I'm going to set the graph. Okay, so it select the same picture. Okay. Okay, we're going to see certain distribution. But you know, it's like what basically typical what you could do in Excel, and you have no idea what these points are. So you really have no idea what you're looking at. So as I said, let's give people the ability to actually look at what these data points correspond to. Ah, the manga pages. Okay, so it's basically looking at a particular manga title. And uh, the pages are the pages automatically right, organized. So the pages which are lighter here, the pages which are darker, which actually titles will be here. And then uh, you know we have some other parameter which controls y dimension. Okay. Okay. Well, actually, I think what happens is that pages which are kind of really light don't have much black here, and here you have pages which have lots of black and lots of texture. You say, that's nice, but you know, can I actually look at all these images at once? Can I do that? Okay, it's going to take uh, first about you know, maybe 20 seconds to calculate this. So be patient. Okay, so all I've done is I've changed. Right? All I've done is check this parameter. And I can also choose uh, how to scale the images. Because if I put the images, you're not going to see anything. And uh, let's go. So let's, I hope the demo guys are with me. Because you know, I might hear, right, you know, it has the slogan demo die. And there we go. Okay. Um, now we still have access to large images, and uh, we see a particular pattern. And you can say, okay, that's very really nice. Uh, maybe what I want to do is I actually want to look at the kind of distribution of particular values by themselves. So I can add another graph, and I'm going to position it on the side okay. right here. And I'm going to change it into, for example, let's say, a uh, histogram. And I'm going to use this histogram to represent basically sequence of pages in the comic book. Because maybe I'm interested in the question if the style of this manga, sorry, title, I'm sorry, manga title changes all the time. So I'm going to display, not, so, not sure it's going to work because it's still experimental. I'm going to display, okay, no, it's not going to work. I'm going to display, let's see. Actually, I'm not sure I can do it because that is. Okay, let's see what happens. Okay, let's see so what I can make graphs, uh, you know, before, before it breaks down, I can make graphs of about 8,000 pixels across. Okay, so I'm not sure it's actually going to work, but I can try something else. Okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, I should, I should, do, I should do a bar chart. Okay, um, sorry guys. Okay, I can't do that. So, okay, so I'm going to do something else. Okay, let me look at some other value. Uh, for example, I have energy, which is amount of texture. Okay, and I should actually change this into this thing. Sorry, I haven't quite mastered, right, how to do lectures. So here we're looking at the sum of parameter and distribution. And it was, uh, which happens to be the uh, indication of how much texture 
how much detail you have in the page. If I'm going to select, for example, this one, right? I can, these pages which have this parameter will be automatically selected, and I can go here and so on and so forth. But here's the interesting part, right? Uh, so uh, typically, right, you know, when you have when you have some cultural data, you have metadata which describes it on many different dimensions, right? You may have, for example, for every page, the number of a page in the title, its color, its brightness, its texture, and so on. And uh, what we want to do is we want to be able to very quickly explore this to see if we find some interesting patterns on some of these dimensions. And uh, here's what I'm going to do, right? So maybe I should make a third one, but maybe the image is a little bigger. So can't make them too big because then uh, you don't see anything. That's why I'm not releasing it yet because it's a problem for us. Okay, so it isn't. Oh, I know it because I put 25 and that's usually issue on this point 25. I'm so sorry. But, oh, sorry, guys. Putting it, I'm kind of putting it in the wrong place. So, so it's like basically, the second time I'm showing this, I'm kind of nervous if I show it in new baby. You know, which made it in Kata, right? So. Okay, so here we go. Okay? So now that I'm going to I'm basically going to change what, what goes on the x and y axis, right? And notice how quickly the program is going to restart. Okay. Okay. So what I'm looking at the combination of different visual features, right? I'm looking at the patterns I'm going to find. And of course, I can also do it and compare lots of different contexts to each other and so forth. Okay, so are we ready? Okay, guys, I'm just going to show, I'm going to start showing it, and if you see it very quiet, I think you're going to see it, because this is basically, I think, uh, We're here in the hyperspace wall in Cal IT2, and we've loaded an image set of the works of... Sorry, thank you. So this is going to be the last thing, and then uh, we can have a little time for discussion. But actually, before I, show, before I do it, let me just show you one more image. So I kind of showed you how we can look at a single mother title. So we don't have the ability to look at million pages at the same time. But that's the kind of interface you would want to basically, for example, investigate social media. So I'm going to show you a render, which took two days, right? which is basically all million pages in our data set. So the whole month of years. And then we'll look at this last video of a more kind of, more kind of uh, accomplished version of our software. Okay, one million pages. Uh -huh. Here we go. So again, the pages are automatically organized by software in terms of their visual qualities. Uh, so uh, the pages which at the bottom, you're going to notice have very high contrast. And then as you go up, uh, you see pages uh, which took more time for artists to complete. They have more detail, they have more texture. So then you can investigate, for example, connection between gender, genre, and style. Uh, by selecting particular areas of the space and comparing comparing set of titles, right? But this is the whole month universe, so let's uh, zoom in. This is 25 percent, 33 percent, 50 percent, 66 percent, 100 percent. It's actually a small image, um, you know, uh, because the big one is will take longer to load. So here we are. This is the edge, right? This is the edge of possible. So as you can see, the image is at the bottom among the pages, which are very, very high contrast. And when you start going up, you're going to see more and more texture, more and more detail. And notice it's a completely gradual development. Uh, so to me, uh, what we suggest is that if you look at manga using these parameters and using a particular measurement system, it turns out that the style, okay, something which does not exist, uh, because the whole cultural style relies on the idea that different artists, different schools, different artistic movements, different architects have a recognizable style. Right? So you can think of style as a kind of box, right? You can think of style as classical categories. But it turns out if you actually look at enough cultural artifacts, at least using the example of manga, right? You have, yeah, you have, you can say that this page is here, for example, at the bottom, 
We have one style, right? Yeah, it's a very high contrast style. New pages on top have a different style with lots of texture. But in between, it's a space of gradual variability. Right? So it completely changes your idea about the style, and I think this is a kind of fundamental questions which user visualization right, can do. So it's not only about discovering new patterns in family artworks, it's actually questioning some most fundamental concepts such as style and genre of cultural analysis. Okay. So uh, finally, let me show you some interactive software. Uh, of Andrew Mark Rothko. Using software developed by the Software Studies Initiative and the Hyperspace Wall team, we're going to be exploring this um, set of paintings using cultural analytic techniques, turning the paintings into sets of data that can be graphed, and turning those graphs into collections of paintings. First, let's take these images and let's move them over onto part of the wall's surface, and then load some graphs on the other part of the surface. These graphs all run over the years of Mark, uh, Rothko's career from left to right, but their heights are indicated by um, different features of the images themselves. Texture, brightness, number of shapes, saturation. And we can use them to explore trends in this painter's life and work. So, Let's organize this tile set that we have by one of these dimensions of data. We can sort through different axes um, looking at something as simple as just the sequence of files, which we can view at different sizes, um, all the way down to a series of dots. Um, and we can size all the way up to high resolution textural images I'm going to turn the size on this down slightly, and then I'm going to add a transparency effect. You can actually see the original dot data in the midst of the color cloud, and by mousing over any individual painting, you can pick it out of the space of color trends over the course of Rothko's career. I'm going to turn the transparency feature off now, and then size these images back down to a normal set. Now we can see the individual paintings no longer overlapping. Let's look at another axis. Um, we can cycle through all of these various axes that, and uh, perhaps arrive at one that has a particular shape or, a, um, or has um, an image like this one right here. We can see that uh, um, if we size that particular image up, that's standing out from the graph and uh, choose to look at it, we can see um, that this one particular painting is uh, quite unusual in Rothko's um, career for one or another low-level statistical reasons. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to do all of our history or all of uh, visual analytics based on um, low-level mathematical statistics. But it does mean that the graph becomes an occasion to pick out an image and say, oh, this breaks the pattern, or this is typical of the pattern. Why? What's so particular about this image? But the important thing about this. Um, so finally, um, I'm going to kind of close this with uh, one more image, uh, which goes along with a particular kind of one or maybe interesting fairy technical implications of both having access to large lots of data and the fact that people are creating right unprecedented amounts of cultural content and participating in unprecedented amounts of cultural discussions today, partly because of social media, partly because of ubiquity visual tools, partly because of globalization, lots of different reasons. Uh, so I'm going to show the image which basically we just did this like two days ago, so it's very fresh. We were trying to see how we can use visualization to very quickly compare 900 mantra titles and see which are typical, which are typical, right? Okay. Uh, okay, so here we go. Oops. Oh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Never mind. Uh, so let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Um, 
This was done by a young designer who goes by the Ali Bean, who was first in Singapore. Uh, actually, no, that's not the one I wanted, sorry. I'm going to get that version, which I think was this one right here. This, this one, sorry. And we haven't, I mean, so ideally what you want is to combine all these different techniques and be able to go right from looking at the man the universe as a whole and zoom in all the way level to the individual image. And you look at Luther holes around this title. So what we're doing is kind of creating all the techniques and hopefully slowly they start coming together. And what this is, is it's a kind of matrix of graphs, right? Where each individual graph shows you one title one manga title. Okay. And again, right, if you look at you know, if you look just at one, you say, well, is it typical, is it typical? I don't really know. Okay. But if you start comparing it, right, if you start comparing all the titles together, the certain ones stand out. You say, okay, I don't know about this artist, but this sounds really interesting. Let me go and investigate this title in more detail, right? So what this suggests, and this is I'm going to close, uh, is that perhaps we're in the beginning of an interesting shift, which is not just happening, which is already kind of happening, I think, in business, in science, where traditionally we dealt with objects, right? but now we have so many cultural objects that perhaps uh, while we can continue, right, yeah. eventually, look at particular objects and analyze them using all the different analysis methods because the objects are particularly interesting and now also have the ability to engage in what Frank Moretti called this meaning, right? We can zoom out and start looking at cultural processes from a distance, but as opposed to making some kind of hypothetical armchair assumptions and operating with very broad categories which are kind of useless because they're so broad, right? Modernism, postmodernism. What is that, right? So broad to be useful, we can actually base this uh, analysis on the empirical study of artworks, but because there are so many of them, perhaps uh, what's, what is interesting about contemporary culture is no longer a particular individual objects are the patterns. The patterns of those objects, the patterns in time, the patterns in space, and so on and so forth. Okay, floor is open for questions. Thank you so much. Painting, we kind of group together, 
and what you saw, I think, is in the beginning, right? The paintings are very, very similar. And then, strangely, as he develops his mature style, the range, right, the range of his works actually increases. Let me play this again, but I don't know if you can do that, right? I'm not sure. Yeah, you only see half of it, right? You only see half of it, but I hope you get the idea. So it's basically both simple thing you can do. You can add, you can take a graph and add them at the time. But I'm sure this is not the end of our experiments. And, uh, this is what we can do. Okay, maybe we'll go to another question just because we don't have much time to okay? I'm also happy to talk afterwards. Uh, Yes. I have a question for the audience. Mm. <laughs> well, nobody else is asking. I guess everything was clear. And, uh, yes. Um, so with your Mark Rothko project, mm -hmm. or even on Yeah. But, well, before you said you got the images from Time Magazine from Google. Mm -hmm. So those are, those are uh, inevitably digital photographs. Uh -huh. copies in. Yeah. There's no intervening film that was scanned that image the entire magazine. So you're not dealing with um, kind of two generation situation, uh -huh. just time to digital. Like what are your sources for Mark Rockers? Yeah. Are they print yeah. or are they digital images or sure. original paintings? Yeah. Obviously not. Yeah. Well, okay, so yeah, so okay, so let me answer it first by uh, making some kind of general statement. So in general, right, you can divide cultural data into something which is digitally native, which is the stuff which is done now, right? The motion graphics, uh, graphic design done with taken Photoshop, uh, right, all the stuff which uh, you create with digital tools. And then there's no problem of translation because you basically have pixels. Now, when you deal with digital media, there's always going to be some problems. Because, for example, you know, how do we know if it's called artifacts which we're seeing it's not some artifact of scanning process. Well, we haven't done it yet, but when I go back to San Diego, I'm typically going to go to the library, get the time magazine, and compare it. <laughs> so in the case of Rothko, we downloaded the images from our store. I know very well that we're uh, imperfect, so that it was really like a must, that it was really to test the software. And in the case of Mondrian, the student took a catalog of Lene and scanned them. And what I would say is that if you actually want to do it like for real, right, you probably have to get a better sources. Well, I'm doing it for you, but you know what I'm interested in is this focus in pathology. I'm not really invested in like any particular or any particular data set. Uh, but also what I would say is that I think if you deal with more and more images, right, is uh, we, have a, we have a particular percentage is flawed and some it becomes less relevant, right? So in the case of one million monthly images, I mean, yes, let's say one percent of these images there's something wrong with them. But it's actually not going to affect the pattern I'm going to see, right? So what I'm hoping is the scale of data is somehow automatically going to take, you know, going to uh, take care of this problem. But ultimately, what I'm finding also is no such thing as good data. So right now we're working with Getty Museum. What can be more respected? We also work with Magnum Photos, and every time we get a data set from somebody, like you know, it's only 40 to 60 percent of it which is really good, right? So just in case you want to know, when you guys go to the library, all these library catalog systems are completely flawed. There's probably 20% of books which are on the shelves, which are not the catalog, and vice versa. And um, I think we can probably go and make like, lots of thousands of institutions and start realizing this. Well, I mean, the issue with Magnum, for example, is the most famous photograph, they don't have a negative. Sorry? The, the most famous photograph that Magnum might have published, which is the Spanish Revolutionary Soldier being shot, and he hasn't hit the ground yet, and he's falling. Mm -hmm. And um, the 500 founders, yeah. they don't have a negative for it. So you have this deep seated, essentially, impurity in the data yeah. that, in certain ways, can only be accounted for by some type of statistics. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, you can also say that you use visualization to notice like, the data, which is kind of bad quality. And it's probably possible to develop also some techniques. Like, I'll tell you a good example, right? So, we've been working with Mongo dataset, 
per year. And then one, per, one of our people on our team notices that out of one million pages, 60 pages are, dou are doubles. Right. So, you know, uh, it's, you know, so basically, the reason, for example, like each of like, you know, like, the reason, like, this manga project is taking a year, I mean, it just takes, it takes a few months to clean up data, right? And uh, even in the case of, uh, so now we did a project where we downloaded every single page of Science Journal from Google, right? And I can show you, like, what happens, right? You guys know that when you go to Google Books, there are all these traces from the scanners. So I'll just show you the thing we've done uh, last week for a show. And we basically had to go and Photoshop this out, right? So it's kind of really, really interesting, right? So even Google Data, you have to clean. So it doesn't matter if it's Google or Getty, it's the same problem. Uh, uh, any other questions? Yeah. Please. Uh, I'm curious about this uh, technology and this uh, social Question that we have to do. We develop a bit of contemporary fictional <laughs> history and also kind of popular, popularity of art in the 20th century depends on the particular technology of color printing and also slide projectors, right? I mean, some of us are old enough to remember we would go into the lecture hall in the 90s and it's all about two slides. And in the fact that you can always put two slides. In some ways, uh, part of, you know, think about McLuhan, medium is message, determined the kind of ar arguments a historian can do, because you compare the images. In the 80s, right, the 70s, 80s, uh, the already existing industrial technology of a system with a slide projector, VCR, DVD, made possible the whole discipline of film studies. So we can say that. The contemporary the 20th century study of media and visual culture relied completely on industrial and casino technology, which was not made for historians of film scholars. So what we're doing is you know, we're using the ideas, the techniques, which are used everywhere else, right? You write, the companies are using it, military is using it, every single scientist is using it, everybody is using it, except for people. But it's only a matter of time. Right. So, so what we're doing is saying, let's, let's take this idea and create our own software, let's create our own tool, which wouldn't just serve a person who wants to, uh, for example, automatically detect faces in the photographs, right, with the eye photo, but maybe I want to detect something else. Right. So the idea is, let's create our own software for our needs, and to me this is 21st century. Right? 20th century like all people wanted to resist and critique because they felt completely powerless in front of these media machines. Well, we now have open source software with Wikipedia, right? We don't have to critique, we can also create. Next question.
So if I would use statistical technique for this, I would say, well, I can divide all manga into small number of genres, small number of categories. So to me, even though data mining uses statistics, I think the logic of data mining is different. The logic of data mining uh, is that you're looking at every, every existing artifact and you see what you find. For example, in Google, right, uh, does uh, the way Google search engine works, you're not doing sampling, right? You're not doing sampling of the pages, right? Because what you can do is you can automatically classify all the pages into like five classes. But you no, know, you're not going to get the results. So what Google does every day, right? Collects every single page you can find, analyzes every single page, and basically gives each page some kind of ranking, right? And uh, this is obviously a lot of new development of about 10, 12 years. And you can use this uh, new possibility of being in a very kind of socially and politically kind of wrong goals, but you can also use it as a way to describe the identity of your data in a much richer way, right? So, it's, so that's, you know, and I think all my work is really focused on this, and right? that's why I'm not showing you points, I'm actually showing you actual images, right? And I'm trying to show you the whole field. At least that's, you know, at least that's a dream, you know, uh, to what extent it's realized, and is it actually possible for us to think about what Bruno Latour calls aggregate, about postulating models, rules, and systems, which seems to be in you know, an innate capacity of the human mind to generalize, right? You meet somebody, you immediately classify as this person, and you see Sherry, the brain immediately classifies it as a furniture. So is it possible for us to use visualization to think about categories, and right? to only pay attention to variability and individual differences? This is, I think, a very big challenge that I think it's interesting to think about in this way. Does this make sense? Change and allows for potential changes, right? 
so again, instead of talking about how one team becomes narrow, we can see how it happens gradually. And uh, finally, uh, the second thing that we can do they uh, allow us to replace, and to me it's very important, right, the small number of categories by I think a kind of rich representation uh, where uh, what you're basically doing is if you think about culture, right, as a space, and if you think about every object as a point. So what I'm trying to do is I said, let's take all these points, project them into the space, and then see if there are some clusters. And if you find some clusters, they can give them names, you know, jazz, you know, rock and roll. And then even another way to find the clusters, right? So let's, for example, go and take, you know, uh, the good sampling of contemporary, contemporary uh, design and uh, ask a question, are you actually styles of contemporary designs or not? I actually don't know because there's so much design being done, right? So what I'm suggesting is perhaps maybe the only objective way to actually deal with this exponential increase in scale of culture is through this massive irritation tools which will allow us to see certain patterns, right? Uh, 
the idea is, well, you know, humanists have access, right? We work with lots of data, especially historians and anthropologists. And to be honest, it's really hard to know what's going to happen. And that's actually what's really exciting, right? But ultimately, I mean, I can tell you, I mean, I can tell you what I think are the challenges that will be here, right? So one of the challenges, and I think the challenges are actually not technological, right? Yes, okay, I can't, I can't right now be able, I can't right now directly manipulate one million images, but it's a matter of time. But I think, as I said, I think there are much harder than conceptual challenges, right? So, uh, like, for example, uh, I mean, you still have a limited amount of time. And eventually, you want to go to the level of individual artifact and really provide the fitting description. And then let's say we're analyzing a particular field of one million artifacts, and the system and the sea, whether in fact there's a one thousand artifacts which are really special, I would still not have time to actually look at them, right? Uh, but I would say, I think to me, the most important part is this, right? The most important part is this, right? So you can look at this graph and you can say, well, this is not a Gaussian distribution. But it's kind of Gaussian, right? You can see that, in fact, there is a kind of center, and there are outliers. So people would attempt it to apply 20th century statistical thinking, and uh, it's easy to say, well, that I'm really interested in the most typical title, and I'm also interested in the most typical title, which is outlier, right? So what you're doing is you kind of, even though you have much easier representation, it's a kind of binary thinking, right? And, you know, when we talk about this video, this computerization, Jeremy started to talk about outlier because it's the first thing which came to his mind, right? So my feeling is that the technology itself contains amazing intellectual possibilities. So I think the trick is for us to really figure out what the technology is telling us, right? Uh, so uh, how can we look at this and really start thinking about this in a different way as opposed to say, well, you know, this thing has a particular shape, with the center or outliers, uh, and, I mean, uh, basically what I can say is that if more people do it, hopefully we'll start figuring this out. Uh, but as I said, you know, I think the technology is really, as it, as it is basically the case of lots of digital media, it's part of a kind of our thinking because it offers certain possibilities which are in some way beyond our potential frame. And I think this is really the challenge is for us uh, as part of the chat. And let me, maybe we can get light. I mean, you think there is now Another interesting thing. Um, so, uh, so the visualizations which I show you are the visualizations of static data, right? And in fact, if you go back to visual complexity, uh, so this is the SNH page, you guys can visit this. Uh, if you go to visual complexity, I mean, there's a the paradox, right? That uh, this is the visualizations of the networks, and some are dynamic, but most of them are static, right? So we discussed in class. There's a kind of paradox in the network visualization that when you think about the network, you also have relative ideas, the meaning of castles, states of laws, the time, etc. What you want to visualize is the process. You want to visualize how something changes, how people are remixing things online, how influences and meanings propagate. You don't want to get the beautiful still picture. Uh, so I think that the real challenge for us is in using these tools it's actually pretty easy to figure out how to visualize something as a structure, as a topology. But how to visualize cultural process as a process, right? I mean, all the different things about all the different people, for example, Paul Rose in New York City, for example, right? Or around the world. And we all thought it's interesting each other, right? Well, so how can we visualize this? I think that's maybe a challenge because I haven't given some, I haven't given some best artist, right? Do it. But, but you know, it's a beautiful challenge, right? So, how do we, so basically what we can say is like what I, what I showed was maybe interesting, but to me it's a stage. So the next stage will be what I hope in five years is the building of visualization of one million one hundred pages, a building of visualization of patterns between audiences, producers, fans, right? which shows us, which explains, which gives us some idea about the whole ecology right? and the circulation of let's say, manga and other forms of which might be used for the culture, right? And I think this is something which, you know, we can do it, but we have to get started, right? And right now, what we know how to do is start with visualizations within the time, uh, but, you know, what I showed you is just development of one artist, right? Uh, so I think that's, you know, there are many challenges. 
Thank you so much. 